What do you think when you hear from fans, white players have all these options and I don't? Well, I, yeah, um, that's not how it should be. Marketing and fandom are two forces that drive video game culture. They don't just impact the games we play, but who gets to be a gamer? We start to see marketing aimed toward gamer bros or gamer dudes. Fucking whore, get back in the kitchen. Saying you play The Sims is analogous to just saying you weren't a gamer at all. I really like this outfit. I don't like having to pay a tax to be black in a game. Yo. One of the best things about video games is being free from the rules of the outside world. Getting out of those boxes that society is always trying to put us into. But the reality is, game companies' marketing departments have spent years categorizing us right back into those little boxes. That doesn't mean fans can't push back, though. Marketing and fandom are two forces that drive the video game industry and its culture. One pushes from the top down, and the other from the bottom up. And each side affects the games that we play and the people that play them. In this episode of Reset, we're taking a look at how game companies have changed us. You can't even play your fucking horror. Get back in the kitchen and finding out how one of the most popular franchises of all time is being changed by its fans. My mission in life is to save all of mankind. In the early days of the game industry, video games were for everyone. Companies generally marketed them like they did board games as something to bring everyone together in the living room. Mom, dad, the kids, maybe even the family dog. But after a few years of wild success, the game industry hit a wall. People just stopped buying games. In 1983, the industry goes through what today we think of as the video game crash. There were too many consoles on the market. There were too many games. Too many of those games were of low quality. And in turn, all of this saturation of the market started impacting consumer confidence and it started affecting investor confidence. And once you start to see those stakeholders pull out, the bottom falls out of this industry. Most companies looked at the actual garbage dumps full of failed video games and said, yeah, this market's dead. We're out. Earnings for the industry peaked at $3 billion. Only two years later, sales plummeted to a paltry 100 million. But in 1985, a Japanese company called Nintendo figured they could make some money in the US. They knew they had good games. They just needed a better strategy. So to get a foothold, they marketed their Nintendo Entertainment System not as a video game, but as a toy, which was clever. But that would only get their foot in the door. Then they started doing something that seemed obvious but that no one else had really done before. One of the most ingenious things they did was begin to hold Nintendo tournaments around the country. I remember these from when I was a kid. What I didn't realize when I was a kid was that this was a way for Nintendo to see up close, firsthand, who was playing these games. And what they discovered was that the majority of the audience were young boys. Now, there are all sorts of social reasons why in the 1980s there would be more boys than girls at a competitive game tournament. But Nintendo was making money, so other companies figured that this was a good lead to follow. But instead of trying to broaden and develop new markets, the lesson a lot of companies in the US seemed to have learned was that boys were the only viable market for games. So they doubled down on that and tried to figure out what would resonate with that market. By the end of the 90s, the strategy had evolved. Teenage boys were now the primary target. And instead of family fun, edgy was the name of the game. It's around this same time in the late 1990s and early 2000s that we really start to see, I don't know a better way to put it than to say, marketing aimed toward gamer bros or gamer dudes, where we start to see a combination of sexualization, objectification of women, or in some cases, treating women as figures, moms and girlfriends who stop you from playing your games. And at the same time, this focus oftentimes on hyper-competitiveness, the idea that competition, not just defeating your enemy, but humiliating your enemy, is what makes you a good gamer, what makes you a true gamer. The word gamer started changing to mean something more than just someone who likes to play games, but something a little more toxic than that, very aggressive. Thanks for the heels again, cunt. You know, I've been called slurs while playing Call of Duty. It was like an organic collection of people perpetrating harassment or being okay with harassment 
inside of their spaces. In other words, game companies started telling gamers, mostly teenage boys, that hey, if you're a true gamer, this is who you are. And for a while, it was like there was an edginess arms race. And for some companies, that meant the more controversial the ad, the better. One of the worst examples of video game advertising from this era around the turn of the millennium is an advertisement for Sega's Heat.net online gaming service. The idea of fantasizing about a mass shooting in an advertisement and a company as prominent and respected as Sega going with this kind of message in its advertising says a lot about how quickly things had really devolved within the industry. This strategy had consequences, but it wasn't until 2014 that the mainstream started to take notice of them, thanks to Gamergate, when online threats and doxing of women in the industry made it impossible to ignore how toxic parts of the gaming culture had actually gotten. It's literally escalated to the point that, you know, I've had to get the FBI involved. I've had to get local police involved to hunt these people down. It is every single tactic they can use to terrorize women in this field and get us to be quiet. Now, most of the blame rightly went to the individuals who were actually doing the harassing. I'm gonna kick my nine and a half inch cock in your asshole. But some people blame the game industry itself. And for people who have studied the industry, it's pretty obvious that the groundwork for this toxic behavior was partially laid by the companies themselves. I can't imagine that these ads would have found an audience if some of that sort of anger and competitiveness didn't already exist out there within gaming communities. But at the same time, these advertisements modeled this behavior. They almost operated as a how-to guide. If you don't already know how to trash talk, our advertisements are happy to tell you. And they normalized it. That normalization, I think, is where the real power of these advertisements lies. Of course, not all video game marketing at the time hinged on misogyny, fantasy violence, or an us versus them mentality. Lovable, unpredictable, programmable, it's The Sims. When The Sims came out in 2000, the advertisers decided to go for something edgy, but different. On one page, you'd have a positive scenario, like, should we spend the afternoon with the twins? And then on the facing page, you would see, or should we take care of the twins? They didn't tend to focus on the same sort of trash talk, because where would that fit into a game like The Sims? The Sims was a massive success right out the gate, but it was kind of an anomaly amongst all the other big budget games out there, mainly because there was no way to win. It was kind of difficult to get people to understand what the point of the game was. It's a game without a real win or lose state. You just kind of keep living until you're satisfied. As far as those core gamers were concerned though, playing a game like that did not qualify you as part of the club. Saying you play The Sims is analogous to just saying you weren't a gamer at all. I remember being a young person who played games and feeling like I didn't necessarily want to make that habit known unless I wanted a lot of people to condescend to me about what kinds of games I play. This is the downside of an industry cultivating a gamers versus outsiders culture through its marketing. Even after fans sunk over $5 billion into The Sims franchise, they still weren't considered a legitimate gaming audience. And now it's at this point where it's one of, literally one of the best selling games of all time and has an huge player base of millions of players. So while most of the accolades and marketing attention goes to AAA games for that traditional testosterone driven bro audience, that misses out on a significant chunk of the gaming population that's always been here with their wallets open. And nowhere is that more evident than The Sims. This is a game that places so much of its emphasis on character. And if you want something to feel living and alive, you need to have characters that are distinct. I really like this outfit. So starting with The Sims 2, there has been a huge modding community that has tried to add in more skin tones, more hairstyles, more clothes to the game. And they are incredibly interesting, incredibly intelligent, wildly creative people. Video games have come a long way since the beginnings, but even back in the 80s, once the graphics got good enough, we started seeing characters that looked like humans. And pretty soon, we had characters of all backgrounds, including lots of black characters. But just like in TV and movies, they tended to fall into some pretty predictable stereotypes. You had your athletes, 
you funky fresh black dudes. We can have some fun. You super muscular yet not so smart fighters. You gang bangers. And whatever this guy is supposed to be. Most black gamers, including myself, just kind of sucked it up and played anyway, because that's all we had. Thankfully, things have gotten better recently. But if you were a Sims fan in the early 2000s, you didn't have to deal with all that. You could just make your own black character. That's the beauty of The Sims. Put your everyday outfit back on. For 20 years, the franchise has let you build your own world and put yourself into it. So it's not surprising that more than 30 million players of all backgrounds have flocked to it. He's not with your time! The promise of you, and not some computer programmer, getting to define yourself in the game, that's amazing. But if you're not white, that Sims promise of seeing yourself in the game hasn't quite lived up to the hype. So over the years, some Sims fans have taken matters into their own hands. Danielle Udo Garanya, aka Ebonics, is one of them. When you were first playing The Sims, what was what were your characters look like? So I was about nine, and I didn't notice this until I was way older. But I didn't really make Black Sims because there was not that much content for Black Sims. So I couldn't really make characters that I felt like were representative of me. Danielle says this really hit home for her when she was looking for a dashiki, but realized The Sims didn't have one. Since then, whatever the game was missing, she taught herself to make with 3D modeling software. She's now made a name for herself, making custom content for other black players. Her specialty is hair, but she also designs clothes, jewelry, home decorations, pretty much you name it. Black and brown people kind of just got used to, okay, these are the choices and I just, I'm a, I'm a roll with this one, because this one's, this is as close as I can get. You made a different decision. Absolutely. I was sick and tired. Really? <laughs> we come in so many different shapes and sizes. Our hair comes in so many different textures and styles. Why are we not represented as such in games? But Ebonics isn't the only one. There are a lot of creators, each with their own specialties. There's a pretty big simmer named X Miramira who created what she called the melanin pack, which added 50 skin tones for black and brown sims. I literally can't play the game without that anymore. It's just, there's just not enough skin tones. She also created a forum called The Black Simmer, where tens of thousands of members come together to share content and build a game that the game's publisher, EA, wouldn't. But just being real, I haven't played The Sims for years. So I asked Ebonics to show me what custom content could do for my sim. I went ahead and I created a kind of base game Betty version of you. So this is you. <laughs> so this, this is what you can do with stock version. I mean, you got the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would love to do is actually show you what we can do with custom content. Yes, please. There was nowhere on the internet that I could find your hair. So what I did was I created your hair. <laughs> okay, okay, I see you. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Wow, you can tweak every single piece about the nose. That is, wow. And my favorite part, skin tones. These are all custom skins. This is the base game. Yeah, this that, is this is, that was definitely box. wrong. Yeah, th this is crazy. This is out of control, <laughs> yo. This is like me, just more attractive. <laughs> I'm screaming. <laughs> <laughs> now, at this point, if this character is in game, it's just, okay, yes, this is me. I'm glad you like him. Thank you so much. One thing that's really obvious in talking to people like Ebonics and my coworker Gita is that Simmers love this game. They're impressed with what EA has already done in terms of inclusivity. That's why they've been so patient with EA. A lot of black creators, like Ebonics, don't sell their work. They mostly just give it away. I'm gonna do a community giveaway. Because while EA has made things that a black player might need, like dreadlocks, braids, or just a basic fade, those are often sold as part of expansion packs, which you have to buy. So if you're black or brown, you, effectively have to pay more 
than a white person to play the game and experience it like they might. When it comes to character creation, yeah. I don't like the microaggression of having to pay a tax to be black in the game. Like it's it's not cool. So so yeah, so it has been a journey of releasing free content, but it's made a massive, massive difference. The response is still crazy to me. It shows the need for representation in games. People are still like, you've changed the game for me. I wouldn't be playing The Sims if not if I didn't find your content. Really? Yeah, there, there's, like there's people who started playing the game because they saw your stuff online and said, "Oh, I want to play with that." Yes. Yo. I am consistently impressed with what our creators are making, and I actually love what our custom content creators are able to do. Lindsay Pearson has worked on every version of The Sims since the beginning. What do you think as somebody who works on this game? When you hear from fans that are saying, hey, I'm black, I'm brown, I've been trying to make myself in this game, and it feels like white players have all these options and I don't. Yeah, it, um, it is certainly hard to hear that feedback because it's not our intent, particularly when it comes to inclusion and diversity and representation. We always come back to that philosophy of like, what else could we provide that will help you tell a better story? I think very specifically to the issue of our skin tones that we're in the middle of talking about right now, it's, it's just taken us too long. After years of being pushed by black players, EA is now engaging with them. And they've even made a few creators part of an official influencer group. These are steps toward inclusion of their customer base that most franchises are not taking. But a lot has happened in the years that it's taken for them to start catching up to their fan base. It definitely stands to point out that for years now, there have been, for example, black creators who have been creating the game that they needed to see because it didn't exist. And that's brought in a lot of people also, people who may ne might not have necessarily played the game. And all that's been for free. Well, I, yeah, um, that's, that's not how it should be. I mean, these people need to be celebrated for the work that they're doing. I hope that we can play some role in giving them the platforms that they deserve for the work that they're doing. And I, I hope in some part that that can, support and recognize their contributions that are so important. Y'all have done for The Sims what I think a lot of people may not even realize is possible for other games. Absolutely. People are needing it in other games, which shows a greater need for representation across so many games and platforms. So now it's time to break it all down with the Reset Roundtable. Joining me on this one is Motherboard staff writer and Sims superfan slash beat reporter, Gita Jackson, along with the host of Waypoint Radio, Austin Walker. Welcome, y'all. Hey, what's up? Thanks so much for having me. When you're playing a video game, obviously you need to identify in some way with the person on the screen, the character on the screen. But I'm curious, do you remember the point when you looked at the character on screen and said, that's me. I identify with that particular character. Yeah, I remember the first time I really got into a game was probably Pokemon on the Game Boy Color. I looked at that little character and there was like no separation at all between that person's character and me, like my literal self. I think that might be literally the earliest example of me just playing a game and projecting everything that I was onto that character. When I think about like the first time that I was like, that's me, it's definitely Skate from Streets of Rage 2, a Sega Genesis game. Skate was named Skate because he had rollerblades. I was lacing up my rollerblades to go around the neighborhood in all the time because it was the 90s and that was cool. And it felt respectful because there's like a flip side to that question, which is, When's the first time you looked at a game and you said, hey, that's not me. And for me, that was probably Street Fighter II, a game I really liked, but Balrog, I don't know if you remember Balrog, uh, <laughs> who is just this like big, dumb, black brawler. Yeah. And I remember being like, man. Yes. But I remember feeling disappointed because like I just wanted the character who I could vibe with. And I, I mean, I remember being like, that's not my dad. I wanted to see my dad Ooh. in that game and that was not my dad. You know yeah. what I mean? Similarly to that, I remember like Dalsim 
And like, I grew up hungry for Indian representation in anything ever. And here is this weird, lanky creepazoid who's got a bunch of skulls. I was not having it. Gita, you're, you're gonna not like this, but the first character that I looked at the screen and thought, oh, that's me, was actually Dalsim. Whoa, <laughs> wow. Yo, Why? I think, okay, no, let, okay, let me break this down. I'm trying to rack my brain right now. This is super wild. But there weren't really black characters that you can control in a game. I'm a skinny black kid. Here's a skinny black kind of man on the screen. Cool, let's go. For a lot of people, the identity of gamer goes above anything else. And and a real gamer would not point out that this, this bothers Yeah, them. a real gamer is, is more concerned about paying. It doesn't care about representation, you know? <laughs> if you step into a message board, you step into a conversation online and you say, man, I love this game. I wish they wouldn't have made that black character so stereotypical, or I wish they wouldn't have done this to this gay character or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Then all of a sudden, oh, well, you're not a real gamer. You're just some, you know, you're just here to complain. Do you really even play games? I wrote this article at Kotaku where I was reporting on fandom, which is something I do quite often. You know, I report on the things that people say about things that they are fans of. You know, those communities, I think, are as important as the games themselves. And that was something we really strove to do at Kotaku was continue to cover those communities and what they do. And at the time that we were first getting voiced previews of what the characters would sound like in the Final Fantasy VII remake, there was a lot of black players were themselves saying the way that they have, you know, the voice they gave to Barrett in this sounds high-key racist and a high-key like he is about to go to church. Like he is delivering a sermon. <laughs> like it was, you know, someone overdubbed it with uh -huh. church organs. It was a very fun yeah. moment of black joy, I felt, like to watch people clown on it. That's easy enough. I'm here for you. To help take the load off your shoulders. I think, oh, it's important to note that this is not something that comes entirely from the community itself. People have become protective of this identity as people have learned that you can leverage a fandom for a lot of money. Yes, yes. Well, this is the funniest arc, right? Is I think about when you first started writing about fandom on the internet, mm. there was a pushback against it because fandom was supposed to be this unserious thing that didn't deserve journalistic time, that was uh, not valuable to anything. Uh, things like fan fiction and fan art were wastes of time until the thing happened that you just said, which is companies realize that fandom is popular with a subset of fans. How do we then kind of legitimize it, corporatize it, turn it into a source of revenue? How do we make it so that we have a spotlight for the best fan art this week as a way of keeping the fandom engaged, blah, blah, blah. And I, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that stuff is bad, but I do think that it's important to understand that relationship was one in which fandom used to be the butt of the joke, and now because it's become a source of value, it's been allowed to be to be kind of publicly valued, publicly acclaimed, but it's because it has been monetized in that yeah. way. Yeah. And that can be really frustrating if you're in fandom and you're just like, I just wanna make cool stuff. I'm not trying to make anyone else money. And then, but then it, at a certain point, the game companies realize, wait a second, if we just sort of continue to feed them little stuff here and there, feed them little tidbits, and get involved with them in any way, shape, or form. You know, have an art showcase, have a song remix showcase, what, whatever the case may be. We can make money off of this. We can keep making money off of some IP that we've done, that we've made forever ago, years ago. You also end up like having a like criticism proof shield, essentially. People who send me mean messages when I write an article critical of like Overwatch's skins for its non white characters or point out the fact that they still don't have a black woman in their game. You know, they're doing it believing that they are defending the workers of Blizzard. And like, that is the thing that is wild to me that corporate fandom, corporate sanctioned fandom has been able to leverage the need for validation so strongly that, you know, people in fandom believe that harassing journalists who just are trying to do their jobs is the same thing as protecting workers. And the far end of that includes stuff like the way Ubisoft teamed up with Hit Record to try to get assets 
for a game that they're making called Beyond Good and Evil 2. What they're basically doing is asking fans to submit spec work which is yeah. uh, which is kind of creative to do work labor, for free. yeah. To work for free, and if we like it, maybe we'll include it in the game, and we'll pay you, you know, we'll pay you some sort of amount, not uh, as much as we would if we hired an in-house artist or an in-house musician. And and hey, if we like it, maybe we'll we'll tap you on the shoulder. Uh, and and to me, that is like the uh, unfortunate logical conclusion of the process. Uh, that kind of recognized the value inside of fan work and decided to commoditize it. And when the when a creative company kind of steps in and says, okay, that's good, keep doing it, but shape it to be more useful for yeah. us, it feels yeah. like you lose something in, in the, the kind of breadth of expression. Now it's like, okay, here is how to be a fan. Participate in this yeah. contest. Draw these characters. Anything outside of that you're disrespecting what we made. But then it, they don't really have to say that because they've managed to kind of create the mentality among a big portion of a lot of different fandoms that, yeah. oh, if you're not doing it this certain way or if you criticize anything, you just disrespect it. You don't actually like this game. You don't actually like this franchise. There is like a message board thread where someone said that me, Austin, and Rob Zachney, who's managing editor at Vice Gaming, should have our throats torn out for mild criticisms of The Last of Us 2. You know? That's all well, you gotta say. <laughs> like, you know, what, what can you do? Love to be on the internet. I mean, the thing that I, the thing that I will say that I think keeps me hopeful is that I think people uh, in a broad way are always going to remain one step ahead. They're going to invent new ways of exploring their interests that have not yet been captured by corporate interests. Uh, uh, they're going to come up with, with new ways of celebrating, communicating, and talking to each other uh, that are uh, going to inevitably make the kind of, kind of corporatized version of it corny as hell. I do have hope and and that that like the next generation of fans will hopefully learn from uh, things like Gamergate that things like the most toxic and hostile elements of a fandom need to be addressed head on, need to be pushed out of that space, uh, and that inside of the space there's a, a kind of a a proliferation of different types of expression. I really do believe that we're going to get, uh, we're going to continue to see this cycle continue, which is some small, uh, uh, you know, uh, benefit at least, some some small consolation. Can I ask a kind of question on the left field? Sure. Do y'all, do y'all consider yourselves gamers? Like, do you call yourself a gamer? Yes or no? I mean, I would say no. It's put weird that though. Like, I would say, no, I'm not a gamer, but I think about it and it doesn't make any sense. But there's something about the community that I've actually never really felt like um, is welcoming to me. Am I on a date? Then no, I am not a gamer. <laughs> am I with someone who knows what Gamergate is and lived through it? No, I am not a gamer. If my Aunt Bitsy says, oh, you know Austin is a gamer, then I'm like, yeah, you damn right I'm a gamer, Aunt Bitsy. <laughs> and that's like, this is what, a gamers can be good, right? Like, it's almost as if there's two groups called gamer. One of them is this kind of specialized term that people who play games use, and one of them is the kind of broader uh, kind of cultural understanding. Whereas yeah. those of us who, like, have to deal with people who have sock puppet Reddit accounts where they're sending death threats to you. Yeah. You're like, I can't yeah. use that word yeah. with you. You're just, no, I'm not, I'm not, you and I are different. We are different beings. You and I are not the same. And that is, that is, like, a complicated yeah, it's, thing. It's wild, it's wild that it, it, it really did turn from, at one point, a gamer was just somebody who spent way too much time in their basement to yep. a gamer is somebody who sends people death threats. Yeah. I play a hell of a lot of video games, but y'all play a lot of video games. And that <laughs> all three of us in here, we're very hesitant about using the title gamer to refer to ourselves. That's just wild to me. Yo. I'm sure we can keep going on about this for hours, but Austin, Gita, thank you so much for talking about this with me. Thank you, Dax. Thanks for having us. And you, definitely come back soon. We have a lot more to dig into on this season of Reset, the unauthorized guide to video games.